I am an avid book collector, and when I travel to foreign countries, I try to buy at least a few local publications. This was very much the case when I visited Peru between May and June of 2019. And so I wanted to make a playlist in which I describe the books that I, and uh, DVDs that I uh, collected, in especially two areas of the country, uh, the first and the third uh, parts of the travel, the, uh, the first being the region of the northwest coast, especially around Trujillo and La where I bought a number of books related to the Mochica language and the ancient civilizations of the area. And I also got a couple of uh, publications in the Cusco area, and I will talk about these books in roughly the order in which I collected them. So uh, what I'm going to be doing is uploading these installments in roughly the sequence in which I uh, collected the books with a little bit of backstory about how I got them and what the books are about. So I welcome you to join me as I begin this playlist, and I look forward to uh, presenting these wonderful uh, new publications that I never would have encountered had I not visited the uh, Peru in uh, during this travel. I find it fitting that I would buy my first book in Peru during my first full day of travel there, and I had just arrived into the city of Trujillo after staying up all night in the Lima airport the uh, uh, night before. I uh, was just arriving into Trujillo, and I checked into the hotel. I had about a couple hours before a shuttle tour was uh, already on its way to this site of Magdalena de Cao, so I decided to tag along because I wanted to make the most of the time, the uh, few days that I had in Trujillo, to begin this first leg of the travel. And so I was uh, kind of groggy during that visit to the archeological site, but I thoroughly enjoyed the visits to the site of Magdalena de Cao, and I plan to make a video dedicated to the archeology span and symbolism of this area that was built by the Moche civilization that flourished during a good part of the first millennium AD. And at the gift shop to the, uh, Magdalena de Cao, I bought the book Cosmos Moche, which is dedicated to an extraordinarily intricate panel that was discovered at the archaeological site of Huaca de la Luna. This too uh, is worthy of a video that I would like to uh, contribute to the Eye of the Serpent uh, channel. And uh, the, um, in 1996, the uh, archaeologists had excavated an extraordinarily intricate mural at the site of Huaca de la Luna that that is replete with images of stars, animals, rituals, human figures, celestial beings, and um, other kinds of supernatural figures. And this is the, the subject of the scrutinous uh, um, investigation that is exploring the symbolism in this uh, edited volume that is looking for ways to interpret the, uh, the, uh, the intricate uh, symbology that is found um, in this uh, one particular panel. And what, uh, and, and so the, Authors of this book look at uh, contemporary ethnographic studies, looking at contemporary rituals, folklore, mythology, as well as colonial sources and the archaeological record in order to uh, propose some interpretations and explanations for the cosmological symbolism that seems to be driving the, uh, uh, the storytelling or the mythical scenes that are being uh, displayed in, this, uh, in, in the mural from the Huaca de la Luna. And the book has much to say about the cosmology, the ways in which the Moche reckoned their place in the universe, the worlds above, here, and below, uh, which I I also, which I um, elaborate in a video on Pacha well, as a concept that was developed by the Inca and uh, the Hechua speakers of uh, Southern and uh, Peru. One of the points that Cosmos Moche makes is that in order to understand the uh, symbolism of the Huaca de la Luna murals, it is important to appreciate the role of myth in Moche society. Mythology was not simply based on the uh, episodes or the stories of events that happened in the primordial past, but were seen to be recurring through nature, through the cycles and the rhythms of time and space, by observing the movements of the sun, moon, stars, and 
other heavenly bodies, as well as the patterns that are, could be observed through the seasons. The moche could situate themselves in time and space and also schedule rituals in order to prepare for important seasonal events throughout the year. And many of these uh, seasonal and um, cosmological events were depicted through symbols, such as these fantastic uh, murals and paintings that were left on the stones, the walls, and even ceramics. The moche ceramic tradition is one of the finest of its kind in all of the indigenous Americas. And these um, images often point to astrological events, such as the Scorpio constellation that is preceding the movement of the sun in the sky. All in all, Cosmos Moche does an outstanding job of integrating archaeological, ethnographic, and linguistic sources in order to uh, present a holistic reading of the symbology in the mural at the Huaca de la Luna archaeological site. The book also came with a companion DVD uh, dedicated to the temples of the Wakas of the Sun and the Moon. Waka is a, a Quechua term that is, can be roughly translated into a space for the sacred, a locus of sacred power and the spiritual presence. And this uh, can be used for a temple, a pyramid, even a person can be a Waka if they are uh, holy in certain ways. And so the Wakas of the Sun and the Moon are the subject of still ongoing excavations at that archaeological site. And this DVD is an animation of how these uh, temples could have appeared back at the uh, height of the Moche civilization, so probably around six to 800 AD. And it is a wonderful computer rendition of the scale models of the sun and moon temples at this archaeological site, including a few animations that reenact some of the Moche mythology, such as the emergence of this two-headed draconic creature that, be, that began to grow and threaten and terrorize the Moche populations until it was eventually vanquished. So it is a combination of mythical, uh, astronomical, artistic, and uh, CGI um, archaeological uh, reconstructions that uh, bring together a 13-minute uh, short uh, film that uh, really highlight the splendor of ancient Moche art and architecture. The archaeological site of Chan Chan is situated outside the modern day city of Trujillo, toward the northwest corner of Peru. And for the longest time, I sought to make Chan Chan one of the priorities of the archaeological sites that I would visit during the two weeks that I would spend around the country. And that was because Chan Chan is a fascinating site, and in fact, it has been recognized as the world's largest city of clay. And it has a variety of uh, panels and sculptures and uh, murals that I would like to explore in this book review by, uh, by uh, Jose Ocas Cuenca on the art and the sculpture found at the site of Chan Chan and many of the other sites uh, of the Chimu civilization that uh, flourished from the year 900 to 1450 AD, uh, up until the conquest by the Inca. And so uh, this uh, uh, book review is going to look at some of the ideas and themes that we find among the Timu civilization, particularly through the uh, uh, art of these uh, ancient cities. Jose Ocas Cuenca's book is um, organized according to two major themes, the first being uh, topics as the uh, elements and motifs found in the iconography of these ancient Timu um, uh, sculptures, but also among the archaeological sites themselves. And so the chapters are organized according to prominent uh, themes that are found across the uh, different uh, regions, as well as the regions themselves. So there is a chapter dedicated to the palaces and the complexes around Chan Chan. There is also a chapter dedicated to the Waka del Alcor Iris, or the Waka of the Rainbow, the Waka of the Dragon, and some of the, uh, uh, the Waka of the Emerald, uh, some of these um, sacred sites that uh, have been uh, excavated around the, the uh, region of Trujillo. And I wanted to open to a uh, sample of that uh, illustrates the uh, various sketches, outlines, and photographs uh, almost entirely by the author himself. And they illustrate the uh, variety of 
themes and motives that are found at, among the many different Timu um, cities. And these uh, illustrate, for example, the pelicans and the variety of ways by which pelicans were expressed through the um, relief sculptures found at the many Timu sites in the area. Among the important contributions of Arte de Barro Timu, or Art of Timu Clay, is the discussion of the thematic elements that are found at these archaeological sites. So it's important to not simply catalog the kinds of uh, themes that are found in the different sculptures around the area, but also uh, possible interpretations. What could these uh, mean? And are there any kind of overarching discourses or ideas that these various uh, artistic styles point to? And I wanted to give an example here of the kinds of um uh, uh, elements that uh, this uh, these chapters explore. The, uh, they talk about the uh, prominence of the sea and marine life and the moon and fishing. And so all if you look at these together, you can see that one of the priorities of the uh, Timu reliefs is the role of the sea and the effects of the moon upon the tides. And given how close the Timu were to the sea and how reliant they were on a maritime subsistence, it makes sense that they would uh, make it such a priority in their artistic expressions at these very psychological sites. And here are some examples that show, for instance, the uh, this row of full moon images beneath the kind of rippling waves of the sea as it's approaching the coast. And because they weren't really using um, perspective per se, they had to use other conventions by which to relativize the position of celestial bodies, the uh, surface of the earth or the surface of the water. And you can also see, for example, this lattice that uh, suggests the netting, the importance of fishing as a, a major source of the subsistence for the Timu uh, societies, especially those that lived the closest to the coast. And so Arte de Barro Timu is a study of the iconography of the uh, Timu art from the archaeological sites around Trujillo. And it does this through many uh, really well uh, sketched uh, replicas of the uh, motifs, the, uh, the themes and the ideas that are expressed in these uh, different uh, locations, such as Chan Chan, uh, the Waka of the Emerald, and other archaeological sites around Trujillo. And so it is a um, very interesting uh, exploration of the role of the sea in uh, Timu subsistence and other aspects of their culture that ultimately found its way into the uh, art and the relief that uh, prevails among uh, Chan Chan and the other major uh, Timu sites found around this uh, area of northwestern Peru. I began my two-week tour of Peru by exploring the area around the city of Trujillo, which is toward the northwest coast of the country. And it was during these first two days that I had the chance to explore several of the major archaeological sites belonging to the Moche and the Timu civilizations, which predated the Inca. It was during the end of my visit to the site of Chachan, which was a major site of the Timu civilization, that I had a, um, a a visit to a, a souvenir store where I saw a book rack that had two wonderful uh, little booklets, one of which I uh, explored in a previous video dedicated to the clay art of Chan Chan, which was of the Timu. And while I was at the uh, gift shop, I also found this booklet, a small paperback about the Moche god Ai Apayek, who was uh, one of the major deities of the Pantheon. And the Moche Pantheon is very interesting. It is a fascinating subject that I plan to uh, develop in a future video. But I would like to dedicate uh, today's uh, talk to some of the highlights of this uh, booklet. It's uh, only about uh, 15 pages, and it is an illustrated account of the legend of a an ancient king of the Moche civilization. The story is a brief recounting of some of the major episodes that took place as the Mochica civilization, or the Moche, were fighting against a rival society called the Wamanchukos, and how uh, during these uh, times, the uh, Moche people elected a Siakich, or a governor, to lead their armies uh, to take the battle over to the Wamanchuko civilization uh, themselves. And you can see that uh, there are several, many illustrations across the uh, pages that highlights uh, some of the important episodes. 
And they focus on this uh, governor who uh, was eventually uh, disfigured through a debilitating illness and was unable to be healed. And it was uh, during this uh, uh, debilitating uh, kind of uh, uh, disfiguration of the face that he decided to hide away until a major battle when he reappeared and he his uh, horrific visage took on a uh, this kind of legendary and uh, mythical kind of guise. And it was something that was so terrifying to the rival army that they all began to scream in unison, ay, apayek, ay, apayek, which is a modern moche uh, name for a, one who slaughters, a slaughterer or a butcher. And this became an epithet for this uh, leader who returned to the people and uh, as a... Um, as a king and would eventually take on a kind of uh, protective uh, figure for the Moche civilization. And so he would kind of live on in legends as a protector and a patron deity as he underwent apotheosis. He became a, a deified uh, figure that uh, would become one of the most important deities, if not the primal, the, uh, uh, the principal deity of the Moche civilization and one of the most uh, recurrent and important in the art and the architecture of the Moche uh, culture. I could summarize this book as a tremendous little surprise in the sense that even though it was a very small booklet that had uh, a short story, it was in a sense uh, very much in the vein of what I had ultimately gone to Peru to uh, research, and that is to find that some of the uh, inspiration for the indigenous histories, legends, and uh, myths that I would like to adapt to a fictional retelling. And that is precisely what this book aims to do. And I like how at the end, it also includes a small questionnaire that would in, uh, encourage students and teachers to think about, uh, reflectively about the content uh, in the story and maybe expand on it. What else could you learn about the moche by visiting some of the archeological sites or researching local libraries? So ways to look at um, well, Peru's educational resources in order to learn more about the indigenous history of this part of the country. One last thing that I will say about this work is that I admired its efforts to use the archaeological details to reconstruct the images and also other aspects of the Moche uh, culture. They even used a variety of uh, vocabulary terms from the modern Muchica language, which is uh, one of the ways by which it seeks to bridge the uh, ancient history of this part of Northwest Peru with the contemporary indigenous peoples who still inhabit it. And so all in all, I was uh, very impressed with this discovery and I'm very uh, happy to uh, present it as a part of the Books in Peru series. For my second full day in Peru, I remained in the city of Trujillo, and I had the opportunity to explore some of the archaeological and historic sites around the city and its vicinity. And toward this end, I took a shuttle tour that uh, took the uh, a team of us to the beginning with the archaeological site of the Huaca de la Luna, or the Huaca of the Moon, which belonged to the ancient Moche civilization. And during this first part of the trip of, along this day tour, I acquired a, a booklet called Trujillo in Mud and Color by Alfredo Rios Mercedes. And this is a nicely concise uh, review of the art and history of the Trujillo and its vicinity. And I wanted to show a few uh, examples of the kind of uh, contents that this uh, booklet provides. For example, some demographic uh, survey of the region of La Libertad and some of the major cities within this department, or again, roughly the state level. And it also has a, a section, some uh, contents on some of the cultural activities that are found distinctly in this area. But I'd like to focus on a few of the most important highlights, uh, such as this um, very handy uh, chronology of the major civilizations of this area and some of the artistic styles featured from the Moche ceramic traditions, which, as I've said in other videos, is among the finest, not only in South America, but across the entire ancient indigenous Americas. These are simply outstanding works of ceramic pieces. And this booklet has um, many recommendations of where to see these play, uh, kinds of works. 
I wanted to also look at um, one of my one of the my favorite features of this um, booklet, and one th thing that I appreciate the most is that it shows some highlights from the archaeological museums that uh, can be visited in around the area, and it talks, uh, for example, about the Moche uh, tourist routes. So that is, you can follow this uh, what's called the Moche route, the Route de Moche that uh, takes you across many of the major archaeological sites belonging to the ancient Moche civilization that um, we could date to approximately 100 to 800 AD, uh, thereabouts. And I wanted to uh, highlight uh, this uh, particular uh, set of uh, images because this comes from, these are um, photos from the Archaeological Museum at the site of the Walk of the Moon. And you'll see in this span that I am providing here in this uh, part of the video that the exterior of the museum is the only part that I was actually allowed to photograph. Photography was prohibited inside the museum. And so there were, here you can at least see some samples of the masterpieces of Moche art that had been discovered at the site of Walk de la Luna, which was was just along the way. It was right next to the um, site museum. One last thing that I'd also like to point out in this booklet is this fantastic map that uh, shows many of the historic regions, archaeological sites, and other um, noteworthy places of interest in and around the site, the region of Trujillo. And this is a very handy way of orienting your position. And it, if you want to kind of schedule in a direction, you can look at what kinds of, of locations, what kinds of sites would be in the direction that you'd like to travel for that day. So all in all, this is a very uh, finely concise review of the um, some of the noteworthy things to explore uh, should you be in the Trujillo area. And so this is a nice way of uh, summarizing some of the highlights that I saw in the area. And in the next video, I'm going to be going northwest to the region of Chiclayo and Lambayeque, where I'll be talking about my visit to the archaeological site of the Sipan tombs, and where I um, had the uh, chance to buy a DVD and and a book that at the uh, gift shop. And uh, so the next two installments will be looking at uh, that region in the, while I'm still in this area of Northwest Peru. After spending two days in the area around Trujillo, I still wanted to dedicate at least a couple more to round up the first uh, leg of my tour around Peru. And so I wanted to stay in the Northwest uh, region in order to learn more about the ancient civilizations of this area. You saw in the pa uh, previous videos that I had already uh, looked at some of the uh, archaeological sites from the Moche and the Timu civilizations. And I wanted to also look at the area around Lambayeque, which is toward the northwest of the country. And Lambayeque is an important uh, hotbed or a, a, a major site for understanding the archaeological history of two major civilizations of Northwest Peru, both of them predating the Inca, uh, specifically the Moche and the Lambayeque um, societies, that uh, Lambayeque immediately following the decline of the uh, Moche civilization around the 9th century AD. And uh, this is a really uh, fascinating subject that I wanted to learn more about. I had uh, gone to um, this uh, part of Peru in order to learn about these societies because the ultimate purpose of my travel was to research toward a science fiction uh, uh, series that I have been looking to write that would uh, draw from the um, indigenous civilizations of the past, present, and future. And in order to travel to Chiclayo, I took a bus from Trujillo. And the, uh, the distance itself was along the uh, one end highway that, uh, that would run along a good part of the northwest coast of the country. And you can see on this map that um, Trujillo is in the red dot and Chiclayo is in the green. It was only about uh, 208 kilometers, according to Google Maps, which uh, would uh, convert to roughly 130 miles. But the uh, actual travel by bus would take almost four hours. And along the route, uh, there were uh, many uh, vast stretches of desert and mountain that were also very inspiring for um, the story and the settings that I would look to um, describe in uh, the writings that I would like to do. And I finally arrived into Chiclayo. I, I checked into the hotel, and it was not until the next day that I would actually visit the uh, city of Lambayeque. I took a little a a combi, like these uh, collective uh, travels that uh, kind of almost like carpooling 
that uh, regularly commuted between uh, uh, Chiclayo and Lambayeque. I think it was about 40 minute drive uh, from one site to the next. And while it was in Lambayeque, uh, it was uh, just an extraordinarily um, rich uh, um, center for uh, learning about the um, indigenous societies. There were two major museums in the area. And the first of these that I visited was the main point of the visit to uh, Lambayeque. And that was to see the Museum of the Royal Tombs of Sipan. So after my uh, visit to the uh, inside the museum, I had a chance to stop and uh, at the cafe, uh, which also uh, served as the gift shop. And if you uh, follow my Facebook page, uh, um, the uh, Shaman's Cross uh, Facebook page, you'll see that I very commonly uh, reference my hashtag mandatory cappuccino. And you can see me here uh, savoring uh, my cup, which I like to do, especially during uh, museum trips, regardless what country I'm in. It's one of my favorite uh, ways to kind of uh, uh, catch my breath and uh, have a little caffeine uh, with something uh, that uh, I really uh, that I, I always enjoy to drink, and uh, you can see me posing to, uh, in front of a uh, replica, a uh, photograph that uh, displays one of the masterworks that is um, presented inside the museum itself. And inside the gift shop, I found a variety of works that I never would have expected to uh, encounter. And these were all so interesting, but I could uh, choose only a couple because I still had some more um, traveling to do on um, while I was still around Lambayeque, and I didn't want to carry everything. So I just had to kind of uh, refine um, or narrow down my options to just a couple of uh, pieces that I thought were especially noteworthy. One of them is a grammar on the Mochica language, and this will be uh, my review in the next part of the series. But the one I want to talk about now is this uh, uh, DVD called The Lord of Sipan, or the uh, El Señor de Sipan, which was a Spanish production that uh, was um, published in 2008. And it is a documentary that uh, runs for a little under 50 minutes, and it is a wonderful review of the history of the archaeology, the history of the research that was involved in the, after the discovery of the tombs of Sipan in 1987. And this was an international sensation because nobody had ever seen such an, a richly preserved and intact collection of artifacts belonging to uh, any civilization in Peru. Many of the Peruvian um, uh, civilizations had been plundered and looted. And in fact, the uh, documentary talks much about this, about the damage to the archaeological record that uh, looting uh, uh, can cause. And so it is uh, very important for archaeologists to uh, collaborate with locals rather than work against them. And so uh, in order to bring in communal interest in the uh, understanding the uh, history of the area and how it pertains to the modern day descendants. The documentary alternates between interviews with archaeologists who directed the excavation and dramatic reenactments of the uh, life of the Moche peoples. And many of the reenactments use uh, replicas of the jewelry and the uh, clothing that were worn by the nobles and the commoners. And in order to respect the uh, copyrights, I will not uh, provide any stills in this video, but I will provide a link in the uh, description to this video that goes to a Facebook album um, hosted by the museum itself that shows stills from the uh, documentary. And it, it is, um, many of the scenes are uh, reconstructed from the um, art that is portrayed in the uh, jewelry, the ceramics, the murals, and uh, many of the other media by which the Moche uh, recorded um, aspects of their culture, their ideas, and their uh, values. One last really neat detail about the Lord of Sipan or that I got at the uh, gift shop at the um, site museum of uh, the Royal Tombs of Sipan is that although the narration is uh, provided in English, the enactments themselves are spoken in the Muchica language, which is used among some of the indigenous peoples in Northwest Peru. And I love these opportunities for the um, Peruvian media to bridge between the ancient civilizations and the contemporary indigenous people.
And this is also a nice segue into the, uh, the next video in this series on uh, my books from Peru, because it will be the other purchase that I got at the gift shop, which was a, a vocabulary of the Muchica language. And so I will be talking about this in the next video, and I look forward to seeing you there. For this episode of the Books in Peru series, I remain in the northwest corner of the country and, and talking about the acquisitions and the purchases that I made while I was exploring the region of Lambayeque and um, Trujillo. And this is actually my uh, final installment um, for the northwestern section because in the next part, I will be uh, describe two of the uh, purchases that I made in Cusco, which is toward the southern um, center of the country. But for now, I wanted to discuss uh, some details from the uh, last book that I bought in the Northwest Corner. This is the Habla de los Mochicas, or the Speech of the Mochica uh, Natives. And this is by Antonio Serrepe Asuncio. And this is a very interesting um, grammatical study of the contemporary language of the Mochica natives who are um, have been in this area for uh, many centuries. And indeed, a good part of the uh, commentary and the uh, first chapters of the book are precisely about the history of the languages in this region of Peru, that is the Northwest Coast, and the uh, various attempts since the Spanish conquest to chronicle and identify who spoke what languages. Uh, the, um, the first chapters are in fact focused on trying to locate and identify the Muchica language in the uh, Northwestern corner of Peru, and uh, try to compare it to some of the other languages that had been documented in the time. Many of the uh, other languages include, for example, a, a language called Olmos, another one called uh, Pesquero or Pescadero, and uh, another, a very important one called Yunga, which uh, the consensus in this uh, of the works in this uh, reference in this book um, suggests that is a, just simply synonymous with Mochica. That is to say that um, almost all of the studies that um, reference and compare the Yunga and the Mochica languages are saying that they're basically the same thing with two different names. Uh, but for the interest of the publication, they uh, stuck with Mochica because that is a, a more direct way of linking to the ancient Moche civilization, which I've talked about in previous episodes. In fact, the uh, last installment, which I'm going to link up here in the uh, corner, is a study or a review of a documentary about the discovery of the Sipan tombs and uh, the history of the excavations. Um, this was the other book that, or the other um, publication that I bought while I was visiting the uh, the Museum of the Royal Tombs of Sipan, which is uh, which is now situated in the city of Lambayeque. And um, I bought both the uh, DVD and this work at the uh, cafe, which is uh, by the entrance of the um, museum. And uh, it was a really good uh, way of uh, getting a few souvenirs and uh, based on uh, subjects that interest me in the area. And this is volume one or tome one of a two-part series. The second uh, volume uh, wasn't uh, available for sale there, but it, it's about the grammar and um, ways to pronounce the uh, the phonetic or uh, the uh, inventory, the, the sounds of the Mochica language and uh, some of the rules uh, toward pronouncing and uh, perhaps even writing down the language because Peru has had a, a new policy of uh, promoting the uh, teaching the indigenous languages and also ensuring that every uh, indigenous language that is still actively spoken in the country has some legal representation and has some translator who is able to uh, translate and explain policy from the national or the state level down to the local communities. And uh, these works like this are important because they are new resources that uh, faculty are now using in order to promote the language and uh, maintain the ethnic and linguistic diversity in the country. And I've already talked about some of the uh, points of the initial chapters. There, there's also a lot to say about the history of the Mochica uh, language and uh, the various uh, attempts to study it, the uh, history of the uh, grammatical studies since the colonial period up to the present day. So from the late 16th century to the early, uh, to the turn of the 21st century, a history of the major the, uh, grammatical studies that have attempted to 
not only explain and um, and document the grammar the 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 grammar of the Muchica language, but also to situate it within the history of the indigenous Peruvian societies, especially those of the northwest corner of the country. Most of the uh, content in this volume is uh, dedicated to a vocabulary of the, from the language itself. And this uh, example uh, has um, an illustration from the Mochica um, uh, civilization with dating to approximately the third century AD. And you can see that it has um, vocabulary terms in the Muchic and uh, corresponding Spanish language. There, it, it, um, one of the uh, first uh, chapters in this, uh, um, in this vocabulary is uh, ba a basic uh, Spanish to Muchica uh, dictionary, and then it uh, the, the the bulk of this work is then dedicated to chapters representing different semantic fields or subjects. So it has a chapter on the um, on spiritual beliefs. It has a chapter on the basic colors. It has a chapter on the wild. It has chapters on the wildlife, and so it uh, covers a variety of topics and themes that are pertinent to um, contemporary uh, Muchik uh, life. And um, so most of the uh, book is organized in this manner. And then toward the end, it has uh, sections that are dedicated to full statements. These are um, sentences or phrases that uh, may be uh, useful for uh, learning to uh, communicate uh, basically with uh, Muchi, uh, native Muchik speakers. And this is a way to uh, base, uh, to uh, give the uh, students uh, some initial ideas about how to uh, say some uh, basic and uh, everyday phrases. Uh, the uh, more uh, detailed grammatical um, nuances and uh, structures are uh, the subject of uh, volume two, which uh, unfortunately I couldn't uh, buy because I didn't see it there. But I'm glad to see that there is a companion that is dedicated to more of the structural linguistic aspects of the study. So all in all, this is a very interesting uh, purchase. It's a, certainly very different. It was the only book that I bought in Peru that was uh, a strictly linguistic research. And I'm very glad to have this because I would like to use this in some of the research uh, towards some of my writing projects in the future. And uh, so in the next video, I'm going to be hopping over, I'm skipping the uh, northeast corner of the uh, Chachapoyas region because I didn't buy any books in that area. But I actually have um, some uh, videos, uh, one already made on the um, the Lembimbamba Museum and uh, some forthcoming uh, projects uh, dedicated to the Chachapoyas and the Quelap civilizations of the northeast uh, uh, section of Peru, that is the Amazonas region. But in the uh, next uh, uh, part of this um, series, I will be uh, going over to Cusco and uh, for the final two uh, uh, installments where I will be talking about a history of uh, Machu Picchu and, uh, and then um, with the last installment, this really fascinating uh, couple of uh, comic books that I bought de uh, that were about the uh, mythology and the uh, ancient history of the first Peruvian civilization. So I uh, look forward to uh, concluding with the last leg of the uh, this Books in Peru uh, series. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode for that. Today is Wednesday, May 27th, 2020, and two days ago marks the one-year anniversary of my flight into Peru. It was my first time visiting the country, and indeed it was also my first time visiting South America or in fact anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere. So this is a very important time for me. This is a very special occasion, and so I'm very excited to talk about the um, when the penultimate installment of the Books in Peru series. And for today, I'm going to talk about the first of two acquisitions that I uh, made while I was visiting Cusco, or Josjo, if you know the uh, Quechua language that was spoken by the Inca. And my visit to Peru would have been incomplete without at least one visit to Machu Picchu. And uh, so you know, I'm very glad that I uh, invested a day to make the day trip. I had to wake up uh, very early in the morning, I think it was around five o'clock in order to reach, uh, in order to leave Cusco and uh, get the train station that took about three and a half hours to reach uh, the uh, station at um, Aguas Calientes, and from there uh, take the bus that would uh, go all the way up to the archaeological site. And I was very impressed. I was uh, very uh, just awe-stricken by the immensity, by the splendor 
of Machu Picchu. And I get, I can simply say that Machu Picchu has earned its reputation as one of the most iconic Native American archaeological sites of all the Americas. The only thing that I could compare to it could be the pyramids of Teotihuacan. And I actually have another video about the uh, elemental themes of the uh, construction and the architecture of Machu Picchu. And I'll provide a link to that up here as a YouTube card. So for today, I'm talking about Machu Picchu in Inca history by Cosme de Cuba Gutierrez. And I have a little story about how I got this book. I was taking the taxi from the hotel to the uh, train station that would uh, lead me to Aguascalientes. And on the taxi drive, I spoke with the chauffeur about my interest in the indigenous histories of the country and some of the places that I had already seen. And given that he saw how enthusiastic I was about uh, discussing the history of uh, the Peruvian um, native cultures, he said that he would give me a copy of his book on his way back. And um, so after I returned from Machu Picchu, he gave me this English edition of the, his book. And um, I took a great pleasure, uh, pleasure in reading it because it is just a wealth of content and the, on the history, the architecture, the culture, just a, a rich trove of material on different aspects of the site in its geological, cultural, architectural, uh, artistic, uh, religious, and uh, social, many of, of uh, various themes that run through this work. This is a, a very extensive and thorough study of the many disciplines that have been used to understand the uh, history of Machu Picchu, its role in Inca society, and its also, as well as its place in the history of Peru. And I wanted to show a few uh, sample pi uh, pictures here, uh, not too many, but just a, uh, a taste of the various um, topics and images that the book contains. Here it has, for example, uh, some images of the architectural uh, themes, such as some of the temples. On the next page, a map of some of the routes by which to access the site. And then on the following page, some of the native porters who are active around the site today, especially for hikers who uh, need uh, help with uh, carrying their equipment. One section of the book that especially got my attention was the part on religion, and it talks about the history of the rituals that were conducted among the shrines and the temples found at the archaeological site, but it also discusses some of the contemporary indigenous rituals that are practiced among the uh, modern-day Hechua speakers. And I really appreciated this connection between of the Hechua peoples of the old and the new, and this was something that I really uh, found a great uh, delight to see um, throughout the work. One last part I also uh, wanted to highlight was just this uh, display of the rich colors that uh, are found among the photos uh, throughout the work. And this is a, uh, an, a selection of the wildlife, the flowers that could be found in the area surrounding the uh, site. So all in all, Machu Picchu in Inca history is a comprehensive study of this important Inca city and the history of its construction and the ways in which it was used for ceremonial, administrative, and other aspects of Inca culture. This was my last full day in Cusco, and I was fortunate to receive a copy of this book, but it would not be the only book that I would get while I was still in the city. In fact, on the next day, I would fly from Cusco to Lima, and while I was at the airport, I would find a couple of really just amazing comic books, and I will close this Books in Peru series with uh, some commentary on uh, what these uh, comic books are about, so I look forward to seeing you in the next installment, and then I will wrap up the playlist with today's mask. In the last episode of this playlist, I was talking about the circumstances by which I acquired a copy of the book about uh, Machu Picchu in Inca history. And it was on my last uh, full day in Cusco. The following day was quite a bit of a hike. It was uh, very much an adventure of uh, trying to get to the Cusco airport in order to complete my uh, travel to in Peru with the uh, last few days in Lima. But, but in order to get there, I had to uh, cross uh, several blocks of the historic area 
area, which unfortunately were closed off for some reason that I had not foreseen. I didn't understand why these blocks were closed off, but for, uh, somehow not, uh, there was no transportation, no taxis could get into the center of this uh, historic area. So the, from the hotel, I had to dash with one hand carrying my uh, heavy uh, bag that was already filled with uh, a week and a half of souvenirs. And on my uh, shoulder, I was carrying my um, bag that was containing my laptop and several other essentials. So I had to uh, sprint across several blocks in order to finally reach the area that had been cleared out and was open to traffic. That's where I got a taxi that took me to the airport. I finally arrived there and I saw this fantastic golden mask again of the uh, visage of the sun god Inti. And as I was going up to the um, level of the uh, terminal, I had a um, a rocotto uh, empanada, a, a turnover that was filled with meat and chili pepper and olives and raisins. And it sounds a lot better, and it tastes a lot better than it sounds. It was really delicious. It was a very hearty breakfast now that I finally had one. And in nearby, there was a, a gift shop that had a, an extensive uh, book collection. It was mostly a bookstore uh, with uh, souvenirs. And it was there that I found the last pur book purchases that I would make from the two weeks I spent in Peru. And they happened to be a pair of comic books that I found in at, at the airport. And they belong to the Sacred Warrior series. They, I got the uh, issues two and three of a 13 part um, series that was uh, made by the um, Ediciones Humedes. And this was just an extraordinary find. I just regret that I couldn't find more issues beyond the uh, two that I found here. Because I really, as uh, even though I uh, really enjoyed these two. I just wanted more. And as soon as I can find an outlet or a way to order these from Peru, I will share a link in the description below because I really want to get the whole set. I was just so impressed with the content and the presentation of these two. So what are these stories about? They are a, as I said, a 13 part um, series that uh, uh, are, are basically a Dr dramatized retelling of the, one of the most important myths of the uh, Inca from the Inca, and that was the um, Huaruchiri manuscript, which is uh, very well known. And if I can find a good link to a playlist, which I've seen before, I will uh, include um, a link that uh, has commentary on the content and nature of the Huaruchiri um, uh, manuscript, which was written in the late uh, 16th century. And this is the backdrop for much of the uh, plot that uh, drives this 13-part story. Unfortunately, I, don't, I haven't um, had the chance to uh, pick up the other issues, but what I have gathered from issues two and three is that what it's doing is it is um, treating the gods and goddesses, some of the major uh, players of the Inca pantheon, into characters that have uh, that, that are uh, engaging in the history of the indigenous Peruvian civilizations. And so this is going in a roughly chronological sequence. It's beginning with the creation of the uh, universe by the uh, uh, major um, Inca gods, and then some of the conflicts that began to ensue after uh, some of them be uh, began to resist or rebel against the uh, sacred order. That is the premise of Uku Pacha, or literally the below world. And from my uh, first video for the series, I talk about the ideas of Kai, Hanan, and Uku Pacha, the here, the above, and the lower uh, realms or realities. And so um, I will provide a link up above. So if you want to uh, take a look at that, uh, you can uh, have, hear me talk more about this concept of space-time in uh, Inca and Quechua culture. But I want to show some examples of the illustrations, the quality of the work and the content that um, these uh, books provide. You can see that it picks up from the uh, conclusion of issue one with a fight between the sun god Inti and some of the uh, enemy forces. And and in this storyline, the forces of the underworld are an army. They are consolidated. They are organized. It is a single storyline that is driving 
all of the issues that, uh, to, uh, as far as I uh, can uh, gather. And this is pacing itself across the various episodes of the major civilizations. So there could be several centuries between issues, but it is basically picking up where the last uh, story left off. Uh, the conflicts that have been driving the forces of the upper world, the heroes, the forces of light versus the gods and the demons of darkness that dwell below who are imprisoned and are trying to... Uh, gain their access to the uh, to this world they are trying to conquer this reality by subduing and seducing and uh trans and turning people against one another so through various kind of um surreptitious techniques they kind of sneak their way into the politics of the ancient civilizations they try to seduce heroes they try to uh, make uh, societies war against one another so that that they begin to call on these powerful forces below in order to gain advantage. And but whoever controls the uh, and, and dominates the Peruvian landscape will be uh, the, the, the ones who will inadvertently bring the forces of the underworld to the earth to conquer the world and to undo the creative forces and the powers of light from the forces on high. So what I'd like to do is show a few choice illustrations that really exemplify the things that I liked the most about the series. This was just a spectacular feat, and I am going to look for the other issues as soon as I can. But for now, I wanted to talk about some things that really got my attention. If you look at, uh, here's page 17, and at the top, there is an image of a mountain that is actually from the Peruvian um, uh, geography. And toward the bottom, uh, there are ample footnotes uh, that uh, describes some of the details of the location, the cultures, and even some uh, vocabulary terms from the Quechua language. So uh, it has uh, many uh, different um, supplements that uh, don't detract from the story, but provide uh, additional information to learn more about the uh, the. Uh, indigenous peoples and their uh, language, their cultures, their uh, archaeology, and just a rich trove of content that reflects the folklore, the mythology of the Inca, the Nazca, the uh, Amazonian, and many of the other uh, native societies that are explored in um, uh, and, and, and represented in the series. I also wanted to look at the uh, last page here because here you can see that um, there is a, a coding, a, uh, a borrowing from contemporary ethnographic sim uh, symbolism that is uh, looking, that, that explains the way the designs and the meanings behind the patterns and the colors that are then um, expressed through the artwork in this uh, series. And then on the final page, there is a list of the colonial sources that were referenced. So I really admire the research that went behind the production of the series. This was just a, an extraordinary feat. And just to see this in a comic book format, this is very much what I'd like to do in some of my own writing, uh, 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 researching the uh, myths and cultures and languages to create a compelling and fascinating and engaging storyline that uh, cuts across centuries of the uh, histories of these native uh, societies across Peru. Uh, one other example that I wanted to uh, highlight here, this is from the um, Wayayo Carwincho, who was a major character in the Waruchidi myth. And on page 22, I wanted to, um, all right, uh, yes, show the exquisite detail brought into the portrayal of the sun god Inti and in the costume, in the accoutrements, in the ornamentation. And this is just a, a wonderful example of the quality of the artwork that was uh, brought into here. And because Inti was uh, such an important protagonist in the story, and also because I had seen him so extensively throughout the um, 
th throughout my travels in uh, Cusco, I thought that this would be a really nice transition into today's mask. But before I do so, I want to thank all of you who have followed me over these past three months from um, roughly March of uh, to June of 2020 as I developed this uh, 12 part, I'm sorry, this 10-part uh, series. And now I come to a close with today's mask and I will uh, look forward to uh, seeing you again when I begin my new playlist and return to Mexico for some of the new topics that I will be exploring in this Eye of the Serpent series. So now today's mask. Today's mask represents Inti, sun god of the Quechua and divine ancestor of the Inca. This plaque sits above the center of a mural painted in 1992 by Juan Bravo Vizcarra for the city of Cusco. Once the largest mural in Latin America, this painting depicts the five eras of the city's history, from its first settlements to its modern days. While the books in this playlist cover periods from the mythical to the present, the sun persisted over Peruvian soils. In this scene, Inti oversees Peruvian natives literally forging their cultural destiny, which I surveyed through this series. I look forward to collecting more such works whenever I return. Please like, share, and subscribe to the Eye of the Serpent channel for updates. Your Patriot support goes toward travel, research, and production. Thank you for watching, and good roads.